The Sportscaster and Her Son is brought to you by Foot First Podiatry. Painful bunions? Then it's time to get your bunion fixed with Foot First Podiatry's exclusive Sklar Bunionectomy. No scars, no casts, no crutches, no kidding. For more information about the Sklar Bunionectomy, visit footfirst.com. And by Electroflex, a global leader in electrical conduit for over 60 years, makers of Liquitite Flexible Conduit, electrically connecting our world. Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Sportscaster and her son, where sports bridges the gap between the generations. I'm your co-host, 12-time Emmy Award-winning sportscaster, Peggy Kaczynski, from NBC Chicago, and I'm the mom and the baby boomer. And I am your other co-host, Jason Canander. I'm a sophomore at the University of Texas. Excuse me. I am uh, heavily involved with student television here. Um, I write for Southside Sox, and I am Generation Z. So thank you to everyone who's followed us on YouTube. Man, we got a lot of YouTube followers last week uh, after our um, our Justin Fields talk. And um, the YouTube numbers are going up. So keep following us on YouTube. Tell your friends about it. You can go to our website, thesportscasterandherson.com. Um, you can also listen to us wherever you listen to your podcast. We're on all the audio uh, outlets that are ava- available. Download us follow us, tell a friend. And yes, we have fan merch available from the Chicago quarterbacks list of names to we don't always get along t-shirts and um, hoodies, stickers for your laptop, uh, banners. We have lots of really cool stuff. You can find the link to our fan merchandise store at T public on our website, the sports So it's true. We always say that we don't always get along, but it's our love for sports that this mother and son that you are looking at us uh, really kind of does bring us together. And Jason, the White Sox are headed to the postseason. The Cubs are not. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, I haven't really thought about the Cubs since we've played them. So I, uh, I'm i not really too... too oh, you, since, since we've played them, what position do you play? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm still kind of in the in the fan mindset. We honestly, truth be told, we haven't talked White Sox on here a lot. So I'm so used to. And when I do shows here, um, whenever Major League Baseball is brought up, it's kind of in more of a general sense. So really, the only time I ever talk about the White Sox here, it's really from a fan perspective. So that's my error right there. But no, as for the as for the Cubs comment, I'm not really ever thinking about the Cubs. I think that they're going to load back up really quickly this off season. And that's all I have to say about them. As for the White Sox, it's, it's so weird. Like last year was different because it was a 60 game season and everyone was kind of saying in the moment, like the playoffs can't be like devalued, uh, devalidated because just cause it's a short season. But I right. think a year removed, no one's really taking last season too seriously so this is really my generation of White Sox fans this is our first real playoff run um it's been 13 years since the last division title I was six years old um this is the White Sox first winning season full winning season since my first season watching the team when I was nine years old yeah and it's uh it's it's really exciting and it's weird because usually when I get ready for postseason baseball, I'm like, okay, like which team am I going to like kind of support? Like which matchups am I the most excited for? And now it's like, I don't really care about any of the other matchups. I just want the White Sox to win. Uh, Do you think that did, did the regular season go as you expected? I mean, we knew with the injuries with um, Aloy Jimenez, the injuries, um, Grandal kind of went down for a while. That was uh, not expected. Um, you know, they really did deal with quite a few injuries. Well, I, I will say before the season, I was fairly confident that this team was going to win the division. And Minnesota was the odds-on favorite, and then Cleveland, and then the White Sox. Um, and the White Sox ran away with the division. I didn't necessarily expect that. I did expect them to win the division. The one thing I think that kind of separates me from the, the majority of White Sox fans throughout the season was with every injury that happened – it seemed like the belief in the team went down. So when Aloy got hurt, uh, all that everybody was saying was, okay, well, of course, the one year when our roster is fully intact, uh, one of our best players gets hurt. And then they were in first place. 
Um, Luis Robert got hurt. Same response. Nick Madrigal got hurt. Same, same response. Grandal getting hurt was probably the worst reaction on all of them. Uh, cause it just came at a time where like literally everyone was hurt. But after all the injuries, I didn't really worry because what makes this White Sox team different from past White Sox teams is the next man up approach. This is easily the most deep White Sox team that I have ever watched in my life. And the contributions from all across the field, like there is no clear MVP of the team. Mm -hmm. there, you could say Lance Lynn was the best pitcher on the staff, but there's no clear best pitcher on the staff. The only like clear best player at their position is Liam Hendricks leading the bullpen. So that's what has made this White Sox team so good. And that's what made me personally not worry um, when the injuries came up. And now this team's fully healthy. Obviously, Nick Madrigal was traded, so all the injuries before the season, during the season, are done away with. The only person we really have to worry about is Carlos Rodon, but um, I'm excited. But above the excitement, I think it's nervousness. Nervous doesn't even doesn't even begin to describe it because baseball is such a long season, but it's also such a long off season. And to think that this whole like what, what was it seven eight months of fun could come to come to an end in the matter of a week is really kind of scary to think about like this team's been so fun to watch it's like one of those seasons you just don't want it to end you and know what's what's interesting is what i like to look at jason with um championship teams is typically they overcome adversity so uh, the white Sox are a team that had to overcome injury uh typically there's also some kind of um i don't know adversity within the clubhouse or something like that uh, that they have to overcome, you know, whether it's a suspension, you know, I would say that the way um, the, the, you mean Marce Mercedes um, incident and with him being sent back down and how Tony La Russa handled things, um, it could have gotten worse. It could have turned into a big blown out situation. And I think it was handled, you know, TLR said he was going to handle it the way he handled it. He's, he spoke his, his thoughts. Teammates spoke their thoughts. They weren't always on the same page. But guess what? They realized that what the team did was for the best of the squad. Uh, it really was. He might have been a little bit um, too much about himself and not enough team-oriented. And this is um, a clubhouse that proved that they are team-oriented. So uh, they overcame that. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of questions I'm worried about heading into this postseason, And that's the, um, the, the pitching has been up and down and, you know, for such a hard throwing, uh, squad, it worries me, you know, uh, the, the use of the bullpen is, is I'm a little worried. Um, I'm going to ask our guest Len Casper about that a little bit later on. Um, you know, Craig Kimbrell, it looked like a great move, uh, when they got him from the Cubs. It's making me nervous. Then they had Dallas Keuchel out of the uh, bullpen. Made me nervous. Not so good. So um, I just don't know what to expect. Uh, I don't feel like they're on this big upswing heading into the postseason. You know, the one thing that you said that I objectively agree with is that I also don't know what to expect. Um, I kind of have had this feeling ever since the White Sox have been locked into their seed that there are only going to be two outcomes to this postseason and it's they're going to lose this first series or they're going to win the world series because i truly do think that houston is going to be the hardest team that they face especially the dodgers are the best team in the entire postseason bracket but if they lose on wednesday their season's over and other than the dodgers nobody out of the national league particularly scares me nobody has a lineup that matches up with the white Sox. No one has a bullpen that matches up with the White Sox. The Brewers have a rotation that matches up with the White Sox, but their lineup and their bullpen is so weak to where I'm not worried about Milwaukee either. As for the pitching down the stretch run of the season, the thing with La Russa is he is so used to having these teams that the entire objective in August and September is to game plan for October. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not playing those games in August and in September to break the franchise record for wins in a single season or to stomp all over your opponent. La Russa and the organization made it really clear in September. Once it became increasingly obvious that the White Sox are going to win the division, that the entire objective for the next few weeks is going to be to set up 
this team for success in October. And between the phantom uh, IL stints, which I think is pretty funny, some players went on the injured list and just objectively weren't injured, such as Billy Hamilton. Billy Hamilton was <laughs> was not hurt, but Billy Hamilton is too valuable um, to have been designated for assignment. So the, you can see between the roster moves and um, the lineups – and like using Keiko out of the bullpen this past weekend, which completely blew up in their face and shouldn't happen in the postseason. But I'm not really worried. The only, like I said earlier, the only thing I really worry about with the pitchers would be the stamina. Like Lance Lynn has thrown the ball a couple miles per hour slower down the stretch. He hasn't been the workhorse that he was at the start of the season, which is fine because they needed him to be like that at the start of the season. They wouldn't be where they are now without him. Um, but there are other guys that have looked really good down the stretch. Like Lucas Giolito has been the White Sox best pitcher in the second half. And now they're going into a series against Houston, a team that he threw a complete game against this year and threw a complete game shutout against two seasons ago. Uh, well, no, that would be 2019. Yeah. So basically two seasons ago. Um, so some guys are getting hot at the right time, especially the lineup. Luis Robert finished the season hitting, I think it was oh, yeah. 345. Right. With Monty Grandal, you can make an argument if he plays the full season at the pace that he was at when he got hurt and then what he did after. If Yasmani Grandal plays a full season, there's a chance he finishes in the top five of MVP voting. Mm -hmm. um, Jose Abreu looked good down the stretch, which is very rare for him. Typically, he significantly cools off in September. He didn't do that this year. Um, Eloy Jimenez, you like to see more out of. Moncada has picked it up a little bit. Anderson, you hope he has his legs underneath him. But I just don't know what to expect. And we can sit here until Thursday and speculate on who's healthy, who's not. You know, What are they going to do with the pitching? Is there going to be a bullpen game? This is where the White Sox and their fans and everyone involved – really just need to trust the experience of Tony La Russa because of all the managers in the playoffs, nobody has better, has more experience in the postseason than La Russa. Nobody has had more success in the postseason than La Russa and no other manager in the postseason right now is a hall of famer. So if it's going to come down to the managerial battle battle between La Russa and Dusty Baker, I'll take the hall of famer with three world series over the 72 year old with no world series. So I'm, I'm nervous, I'm worried, but I'm also trying to kind of be realistic with it because when you have a team that has known that this is where they're going to be for over two months now, I just don't think that it's very smart to judge what they've been doing the last two months of the season because they haven't really been trying to win at times. They've more so just been trying to prepare for this week. Right. Well, Jason, let's bring in our guest, the voice of the Chicago White Sox on ESPN Radio, and you can follow him on Twitter at Len Casper, also available now for personal messages for you and your family on those special occasions on Cameo. Len Casper is joining us, and I'm going to get right into the first question. Interestingly, Len, the Dodgers are favored to win the World Series. Uh, they, despite being a wild card, uh, still have to get past the Cardinals and the Giants just to get there. But in the American League, the Astros are favored, then it's the Rays, then the White Sox. So the Sox actually would match up better with any other team in the American League than the Astros. This is really a tough draw for them, isn't it? But I think the Sox feel confident now. You know, Aloy Jimenez and Luis Robert were both uh, on the injured list uh, for all seven regular season games. I know Alex Bregman was not available for the Astros. Uh, the Astros have had some bullpen issues, and uh, I, I, I think this will be a very competitive series. I'd be very surprised if it's not. Let's put it that way. And, and this is a different Sox team that was matched up with them back in July, which, uh, you know, so many teams are so banged up heading into the postseason. It's the opposite for the White Sox and very, very uh, smartly used roster heading into the end of the regular season. For sure, and I think the big injury question is Carlos Rodon. We're not quite sure uh, if he'll be able to pitch, and if so, how how much. Um, my hope, and I think the White Sox hope, is that you know he can be a part of e e even a tandem type start, maybe with Michael Kopech and or Ronaldo Lopez. Um, we don't exactly know who's going to start Game Three, but you know Dylan Cease 
has had a sneaky good year. And last year he ended up pitching out of the bullpen in that series in Oakland. Um, I, I, my gut tells me that Dylan will get a start and it could be game three, which is always a critical one, that first game at home on Sunday night. And then, um, you know, you still have Rodon and Kopech and a lot of other guys you can use in kind of a shortened start. Everything changes now. You know, you don't have a typical six inning start for a starting pitcher. It'll be a short leash, a quick hook, whatever analogies you want to use. But um, the bullpen becomes even more important in a shortened series. So yesterday I was kind of like going through and looking at all the numbers. And one thing I noticed, and I actually was kind of surprised by it, is in Lance Lynn's last three starts against Houston, he's allowed at least six earned. Is that something that the White Sox look at and take into account? Or is it something like this guy was great for us during the regular season, almost started the All-Star game, will likely be top three in the Cy Young voting. We don't care what he's done against this team in the regular season. Or do they look at that and take that into account with their decision making? Jason, I think it's both. Uh, the, the Astros are a very good fastball hitting club, and that's what Lance Lynn does. So, um, But I also think he was a huge part of this 93-win team, and he was hugely important in getting the White Sox to where they are. So he's going to pitch either game one or game two uh, and probably would be available to come back in game five. So, yes, uh, they're well aware of it. He's well aware of it, um, but he's going to play a big role in this series regardless. Another thing that I was kind of thinking about is, like you mentioned, it is kind of a shorter series, five games. Last season for the playoffs, when the White Sox got to the game three in the three-game series, they, they essentially kind of lost the game because of how poorly the bullpen was managed. It was almost overmanaged. Do you think that the White Sox are also going to take last season into account if they do find themselves in a game four, game five without a starter, with somebody on short rest? Or is it going to be what La Russa is more accustomed to, where it's you have a guy who's just going to go and get the ball and throw until he can't anymore every single game of the postseason? Yeah, I think that's that's more likely the scenario. And as I said, you know, if somebody gets in trouble in the second or the third inning, you're, you're probably going to have people up and you're going to think about getting them out of there. Um What's Dallas Keuchel's role in this uh, series? You know, will he be the long man? Chin is very good, and the White Sox struggled against guys like McCullers and Garcia and Urquidy. Um, but if you can get into their bullpen early, uh, I think that's one way uh, for the White Sox to, to win this series. So I think both teams are going to try to do the same thing, essentially, and, and, and try to get deep into the bullpen as fast as they can. But, you know, the Astros are battle-tested. Uh, other than the Dodgers, they've played more postseason games than any uh, group uh, in this current playoffs, and they're going to be a tough out. And uh, I think the White Sox are the kind of team that nobody wants to play because when their offense is at its best, it can be the best in the league. And as I said, that starting rotation was arguably the best in the American League over the 162. Speaking of the Sox offense, Lynn, uh, Len, if, if, if they are patient – they should be able to get to the Astros pitchers. Are they going to have to uh, sit back a little bit and not be too aggressive going for the long ball and maybe taking some more walks? Well, it's something they did a lot you know, during the season. I think Grandall had a great year. Moncada walked over 80 times as well. Uh, I don't know how much Andrew Vaughn's going to play, but he has a pretty uh, patient approach. And Jose seemed to take more walks late in the year. Uh, w once Aloy and, and Robert were back, you know, understanding that, hey, if I get on, somebody else can drive me in. So uh, I want to say the White Sox finished second in the league and on base percentage, which is a good sign. And uh, yeah, yeah, I do think that um, patience was one reason why they scored nearly five runs per game. And, you know, Tim is aggressive. We know that Luis is aggressive. Uh, those guys are going to do what they do, but I think that it leads to a dynamic offense in that you have some different pieces, and the middle of the order in particular is, has been pretty patient. You, you mentioned uh, Tony La Russa, and um, Jason mentioned him. I, I mean, this is what they brought him in for, October baseball. Give me your impressions of TLR and and what you've seen, how he has, Jason and I got to, to meet him and met him um, golfing at Medina and um, got to talk to him a little bit. 
And I was very impressed with uh, just, he's just a really smart baseball guy. How has he managed this club, this clubhouse, and how have these players reacted so well to it? Well, I think he did the smartest thing right off the bat. He came in and he said, this is your team. And it was Tim and Jose. And Tony came in knowing that he would have to prove to them that he knew what he was talking about. And I think that was the really smart thing, that he knew this was a really good team already. And uh, I think they embraced him right off the bat in that regard, you know. And it took him maybe a month or two to get to know the club in terms of the personnel top to bottom. Uh, I love Tim's line early in the year. He's the dad, we're the bad kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's kind of a an avuncular type relationship uh, that he has with, with this group. But I've seen him have a lot of fun uh, on the planes and on the road trips where, uh, you know, he doesn't take himself that seriously. And I think that goes against type. Uh, he maybe has softened a little bit uh, as he's gotten older. I've been very lucky in getting to talk to him every day for the manager's show. You're right. He's really smart. He's one of the smartest baseball people I've ever met. And he lives and breathes baseball 24 hours a day. And I don't think that's ever going to change. And I don't think this is a one and done. I think he wants to be the White Sox manager until he's 80. Wow. Wow. That's, I, mean, I, I love to hear that. But um, so, per, so back before you were at the White Sox, you were at the Cubs. So you had done – covered the Cubs on play-by-play play for the Cubs against some of La Russa's best Cardinals teams. Does this White Sox team remind you of any specific Cardinals team that La Russa managed um, from 2011 and, and beyond then? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if this team reminds me of any other team. It, there's a unique quality to it because of that dynamic offense I mentioned and kind of an older school rotation um, that, you know, we haven't seen around the league a lot. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't really say that. Uh, I think this White Sox team is one of a kind in a good way. And it, it's a very energetic team. It's a team that doesn't quit. And I think if there's one key guy, it's Tim Anderson. When he's in the lineup, it's just a different offense. And I think he proved over the last couple of weeks that he is healthy. And he dominated one game on this last homestand with his legs. And I think he's going to have to do that in the postseason as well. Yep, mom. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I have a question about Tim Anderson. This <laughs> and this, Len, I don't like, I'm not around the team anymore, but I watch a ton of games. And from the very beginning of the season, this thing started and everyone does it. And then the finger thing started. Do we know what that is all about? I don't know specifically, but I do know that when you when you put the hands together, that means hit. And so it's just, you know, I probably I got a hit. That, yeah. that, that's probably what it is. But guys are weird about that. It's funny, like um, over the years, you'll I'll ask somebody, hey, what is that little signal there? And they're like, well, it's kind of an inside thing. So <laughs> I, I tend not to ask, but every team has it. And that's the thing for this Sox team. You know, speaking of Tim Anderson, you know, the on the biggest stage that they had this year with the Field of Dreams game is when he came through. Now this is a big stage for a lot of these young guys who haven't been there before, but they seem to enjoy the spotlight. If you had to pick one of these guys that hasn't been in the postseason before, and let's not let's exclude last year. I agree. Who would you pick as having the potential to really shine on the big stage? I got to go with Luis Robert. I think he has the potential to be an MVP and can take over a game single-handedly. And uh, I would say he's kind of the guy, whether it's second in the lineup behind Tim and ahead of Jose or maybe lurking down in the sixth spot, uh, I think he has a chance to, to be a difference maker in this postseason for sure. I love it. And hey, uh, have fun with your cameos. I love the fact that you're now doing cameo where you get to send messages to to Sox fans. And I'm sure you even get a couple of old Cub fans as well. 
I do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been fun. You know, I don't do a ton of them, but, uh, people seem to get a kick out of it. And, uh, I like doing a lot of winning anniversaries and, uh, and the, and the like, but, uh, it's, it's pretty cool that people think it's, uh, uh, they think it's neat. I'm usually like, Hey, remember me for a Cubs <laughs> fan and, uh, for White Sox fans, it's been like, Hey, thanks for welcoming me into your family. <laughs> uh, Len, that's pretty much what I do every day on my podcast. Hey, remember me? I used to be on TV. Right. right. <laughs> Len Casper, voice of the White Sox, ESPN Radio. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the podcast. Peggy, Jason, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, keep up the great work. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess we're going to find out very soon what happens in this ALDS against the Astros with the White Sox. Jason, let's go to your predictions. Okay, so none of these are going to be baseball related because I am awfully superstitious around this time of the year. So I don't want to jinx anything. Um, no, nothing. Yeah, nothing baseball related. Um, as for the other sports, so the NFL right now, Bears Justin Fields picked up his first win as a starter on uh, Sunday. Make that, but on Monday, Matt Nagy still said that Andy Dalton's a starter as long as he's healthy. Um, I'm going to say that that is completely incorrect, and that uh, Dalton will likely be out on this upcoming Sunday against Las Vegas. I think if Justin Fields shows out, which he probably will. Um, the Bears are going to have no choice but to stick with him. So I'm calling Nagy out there. I'm going to say that Fields is going to pretty much be the starter the rest of the way. Uh, All right, um, prediction number two. Yeah, prediction number two. I'm going to say that uh, Cincinnati makes a college football playoff. They beat Notre Dame on Saturday. Group of five team has never made the playoff. Cincinnati is ranked, I want to say, fifth right now. Uh, that would that means that they just need one more loss from a team in the top four, and then if they win out, they'll ride in. And two of the teams in the top four, Iowa and Penn State, play each other on Saturday. So that is essentially an elimination game leading up to the Big Ten Championship in a couple months. So I'm going to say Cincinnati makes a playoff. Not as bold as a prediction as it was when I made it on one of our student TV shows a month ago, but still fairly bold uh, considering that they're looking to do something that has never happened in the seven years of the playoff. All right. Do you have a third? Yes, I do, in fact, have a third prediction. And that third prediction um, is that Texas is going to beat Oklahoma this weekend. Uh, <laughs> I've always said that I just want one win over Oklahoma in my four years as a Texas student. Um, Oklahoma has played everybody close this year. Um, they actually have not covered the spread at all this season, they're 0 and 5 against the spread, which typically doesn't bode well because when something happens five times in a row, uh, it means it's not going to happen on time number six. But they could still, um, they could still cover, or no, they actually can't cover the spread and still lose. I'm just, I, I think Texas is going to win. Uh, Sarkeesian has them playing their best ball at the right time. Offense looks great. Bijan Robinson's a Heisman front runner at running back. It's going to be an amazing, amazing, amazing environment in Dallas. Cotton Bowl, college game days there, full crowd uh, opposed to last year. So I think that Texas is going to beat Oklahoma. I hope I don't jinx it, um, but I would take a Texas loss if it meant a White Sox series win. Absolutely. All right. I have some final thoughts, and it's actually looking back to episode number 48. In that episode, we made our predictions on Cubs and White Sox wins. The White Sox finished the regular season with 93 wins. The Cubs finished with 71 wins. So, Jason, let's take a look at how we did. 93 wins for the White Sox. You predicted they would win 98 games, and then you went a little broader and said 95 to 102. Yeah, you were getting a little excited there. I was I was two games off. Yeah, so the Cubs, with their 71 wins, you predicted that they would have 72 to 80. So I was one game off. Yeah, you were actually the closest. Um, my predictions, I said the White Sox would have 96 wins. I actually was closer than you on my predictions for the White Sox. Um, them finishing with 93, I said 96. And I said that the Cubs would have 80 wins. And yeah, I was nine games off on there. Let's take a look and see how our guests did. John Greenberg from The Athletic had the White Sox with 89 wins and the Cubs 86. <laughs> <laughs> 
Paul Sullivan from the Chicago Tribune had the White Sox with 85 wins and the Cubs 82. Wah, wah for both of them. <laughs> Dan Roan, he was good. He predicted the White Sox would have 94 wins. Ooh, one off. One yeah. off. And he said the Cubs would have 81 wins. Okay. So far, nobody's close on the Cubs, you know. Except for me. Uh, except for you. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, Mark Potash from the Chicago Sun-Times, he predicted the White Sox would have 86 wins and the Cubs would have 84 wins. Again, everybody was predicting way more Cubs wins, but, you know, the fire sale didn't help. Richard Roper, our, our movie critic, our entertainment reporter, Predicted the White Sox would have 90 wins. Good call there, Richard Roper, the White Sox fan. And that the Cubs would have 81 wins. I just want to say really quick, I I just don't remember like this many people undershooting the White Sox. Like I yeah. I kind of feel like the, I I feel like I remember there being like higher expectations than this going yeah. into the season. Only the only ones that predicted the White Sox would have 90 or more wins was Richard Roper, Dan Roan. And then uh, me and you. So uh, good job on that. Um, hey, tell Jason, why don't you tell people if they like the episode, what they can do um, in, in following us and finding out more about it? Well, there are a lot of things you can do if you like our episode. But uh, what my mom wants you to tell, wants me to tell you to do if you like our episodes, uh, please like, rate, subscribe, do it over again, share it, send it to your family, your friends, your neighbors, your cousins, your uh, classmates anybody that you want to send it to, it helps. Um, you can listen to our podcast pretty much everywhere at Office Podcast. So it would be Apple Play, Google, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, 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 YouTube. We are in on YouTube with the new StreamYard setting. It is awesome to watch my beautiful face and my mom's beautiful young face uh, talking from sports. So definitely check out YouTube and subscribe there. Um, and yeah, if I forgot something, it's probably doesn't matter because it's probably not one of our more popular streaming sites. So no. And listen, if you follow our oh, website, barroom network, cannot forget the barroom network, barroom obviously network, the barroom exactly. network. on yeah. Podbean. Um, and, on Podbean. And if you follow us on our website, there are behind the scenes blogs with um, some stories about why we picked certain uh, themes or um, guests for our shows. Um, you can listen, you can check it out. You can look at our uh, gallery of photos as well. Um, we've got a great website at the sportscasterandersun.com. Don't forget, as Jason said, you can also check us out on YouTube. I have another show that I do on YouTube, part of the Barroom Network. It's called Pass the Mic, where we highlight women in sports and sports media. Um, hey, thank you to Len Casper. You can hear him on White Sox Radio on ESPN 1000 Chicago. Also, thanks to Eldo Gandia and the Barroom Network. Thanks to Adam Yoffe uh, for all of his expertise um, in snipping the show as well. That's going to do it for this episode episode. Good luck to the White Sox. Have a good one, Jason. Hang in there. Don't get too excited. Don't get too low, okay? Good luck to the White Sox. Uh, hook them horns this weekend and get vaccinated. Stay safe. I'll talk to you soon, Mom. All right. See you guys. Love you, Jason. Love you too. Okay, bye. The Sportscaster and Her Son is brought to you by Electroflex, a global leader in electrical conduit for over 60 years, electrically connecting our world. And by Foot First Podiatry. It's time to get your bunion fixed with Foot First Podiatry's exclusive Sklar Bunionectomy. No visual scars, no casts, no crutches, no kidding. Visit footfirst.com. Hey, everybody, it's Peggy. Thanks for watching this episode of the Sportscaster and Her Son. Do me a favor, click subscribe.